Oh, we have a question from Dr. Clear. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, so thank you everyone for waiting um, and welcome. My name is Elisa Yu and I am the student president of the Biological Society. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to our 88th inaugural address, as well as our first online inaugural address. I know this event hasn't necessarily been what we were expecting, but I'm very happy to see so many different groups of people here tonight, everywhere between students, alumni, and lecturers. So thank you so much for attending. And if you don't mind checking to make sure that your cameras are off and your microphones are muted at this time, that would be great. Um, the Biological Society feels very honored to have Professor Hannah McGee in attendance today. So thank you, Professor, for being here. Our theme for the 88th inaugural address is the impacts of a global pandemic, the ways COVID-19 has influenced our lives and united medical forces. We have four esteemed speakers here with us today, with Professor Arnold Hill as our WIDES lecturer. Our speakers will each be discussing a different perspective of the global pandemic. Everything from the changes in medical school teaching, vaccinations, the impact of the pandemic, as well as being a surgical intern during these unprecedented times. Please find the accompanying brochure in the Microsoft Teams chat that I'll send out in just a moment that gives further detail on our speakers and our inaugural address. I feel very fortunate to have an incredible council that has been able to make this entire transition online, as well as all of our other events online. So fellow members of the Biological Society, if you don't mind turning on your cameras, I would like to introduce our Biological Society's committee for this year. Thank you to everyone for making this event possible. I feel very grateful to have such a hardworking and dedicated team this year. Finally, I would like to thank our incoming, our incoming faculty president, Professor McCall Walsh. In the short amount of time that we have worked together, you have continuously offered your guidance and direction no matter what time of day. Your generosity means so much to me and the committee, and I feel very fortunate to be working with you during my time as student president. So thank you, Professor McCall Walsh. It gives me great honor to introduce our outgoing faculty president. She has been an inspirational role model and an outstanding leader to the Biological Society. And although the Biological Society will miss you, we can all confidently say that the RCSI Surgical Society has gained an outstanding faculty president. I would like to introduce our outgoing faculty president, Professor Camilla Carroll, to pass the chain of office to Professor Rory McCon Walsh. Good evening and welcome. Thank you, President Yu, for your opening remarks. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate you on your election as 2021 student president of the RCSI Biological Society. And I wish you good luck over the coming year. The Biological Society is an historic RCSI student society, which affords its members the opportunity to grow and develop in an holistic way as medical students through the various undertakings of the society. It has been a personal honor and privilege to have served as the faculty president with student president Gitmi Gamage and her team in 2020 and student and student president Dr. Safari Akesh and his team in 2019. I would also like to thank Dr. Katie Dunleavy for my nomination to this role in 2018. Currently, Dr. Dunleavy is in the Mayo Clinic Gastroenterology Fellowship Program, having just completed her residency in the internal medicine at Mount Sinai, New York, with Professor Barbara Murphy, RCSI class of 1989. This evening, I am delighted to welcome 
Professor Rory McCon Walsh as the incoming Biological Society faculty president for 2021. Professor Walsh is well known to RCSI medical students as an educator, mentor, and senior surgeon and past president of the RCSI Surgical Society. Professor Walsh is a consultant otolaryngologist, head and neck surgeon, and clinical head of department at Beaumont Hospital, and the chairman of the National Surgical Training Programme for Otolaryngology in the Republic of Ireland. He is a national and international leader in neurootology and skull base surgery. And he holds many professional roles in Ireland, Great Britain, and Europe in these areas. Professor Walsh is a surgeon scientist with over 120 peer reviewed publications. And he has been an invited speaker at over 340 national and international meetings to date. In his role as chairman of our training program, Professor Walsh has raised the profile of our specialty and modernized ENT surgical training in Ireland by incorporation of skills training exemplified by the annual temporal bone dissection course which he developed and introduced into the training program alongside the inclusion of simulation skills training. Speaking on behalf of my colleagues, I would like to thank Professor Walsh for his tireless efforts in ensuring that our trainees remain safe as they carried out their clinical duties during the ongoing pandemic. Undertaking airway surgery and aerosol generating procedures on the backdrop of COVID-19 has not been an easy task. But Professor Walsh lobbied the HSE to ensure that our trainees were provided with appropriate PPE and the specialized equipment necessary to secure the safety of our patients and our trainees. It is important to acknowledge the collaboration in this regard of Professor Deborah McNamara, NCPS co-lead, and Professor Michael Walsh, National Clinical Advisor, in facilitating funding streams for essential equipment. Rory and Kathy are committed parents and are ever present in their children's lives. Their joy and happiness is infectious as they stand on the side of a pitch cheering on their son on a wet winter's evening in Black Rock or transporting a carload of under 16 lady hockey players on their way to represent Ireland at an international competition. Professor Rory McCon Walsh cares deeply about his patients, his colleagues, and his trainees. It is this professionalism, compassion, and dedication that will ensure that the RCSI Biological Society will thrive under his presidency. President Yu and the 2021 Executive Committee, society members past and present, I would like to leave you with the words of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. The power to question is the basis of all human progress. Congratulations 
Professor Rory McCon Walsh, and a wonderful year lies ahead of you. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Professor Carroll, for those very kind words. They are very much appreciated. It is truly a great honour and privilege to be nominated as the faculty president to the RCSI Biological Society at this, the 88th inaugural address of this very historic society. I know I have a very hard act in following you, Camilla, as you've done such a great job for the past two years. I very much look forward to working very closely with the student president, Elisa Yu, and the entire council during my tenure as faculty president. I would like to thank you, Elisa, and the council for the very professional way you have gone about organising this evening's meeting in conjunction with Jackie Knowles, the student services coordinator. I've already been involved with the society at the Harold Brown Anatomy Quiz, and I very much enjoyed that evening. The theme of this evening's virtual inaugural address and meeting is unsurprisingly COVID-19 and the ways it has influenced our lives and united medical forces. I am very much looking forward to what should be a very exciting and topical programme this evening. Although this is a virtual meeting, Elisa and I would like to encourage questions and interaction from the audience at the end of the four presentations. The WITIS lecture address will be delivered by Professor Arnold Hill, followed by three guest speaker addresses by Professor Samuel McConkie on COVID vaccination, Dr. Owen DeBarra on discussing the COVID pandemic, and Dr. Owen Clear on the pandemic intern. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Arnold Hill, who will be delivering the WITIS lecture address entitled How Our Medical School Has Adapted to COVID and the Implications for the Future of Medical Education. Professor Hill really, no, need, need, really needs no introduction to you at all, as he is so well known to all of you. He is the head of the School of Medicine at the RCSI, Professor and Chair of Surgery at the RCSI, National Advisor for Surgical Oncology at the National Cancer Control Programme, and President of the Surgical Research Society. So without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Hill to deliver the WITIS lecture address. Thank you. Ari, you need to unmute. Sorry. <laughs> and I see that he was appointed in 1938 as a lecturer in RCSI, and he finally became a full professor in 1960. Now, I do hope that the promotions process in RCSI has improved a little bit uh, in today's uh, terms. Uh, very impressive. Uh, Professor Wittes uh, started in the biology department, ended up in the physiology department and was editor of the college journal for many years. So a very uh, distinguished record and it's a great honor uh, to be giving uh, this lecture after a number of uh, previous distinguished uh, lecturers. What I want to talk about tonight is how RCSI Medical School adapted to COVID and what are the implications uh, for the future of medical education, particularly 
in RCSI. So this symbolized a change on the left where we had scrubs, on the right PPE, something that we were not familiar with uh, in March last year. So we were lucky uh, that we had Sam McConkie with us in RCSI and Sam was the head of the tropical medicine department and probably a relatively uh, unknown person in January last year, but someone that Cahill Kelly listened to very wisely when he said to him, I think there's something going on in China, we need to be careful. And we certainly listened and prepared. And it's fascinating to look at uh, Sam's history uh, since then. He's now a media personality. He sometimes manages to get on four radio stations a day and always finishes the night with Claire Byrne Live. So an extraordinary uh, media personality. I believe he's been on Claire Byrne more than Luke O'Neill. Uh, but that remains to be confirmed. So well done to Sam and uh, certainly alerting us about COVID and the impending changes. So what happened? We've then, after hearing, listening to Sam, we got information from our international campuses in Perdana, Penang and Bahrain that things were changing. And we planned in January 2020 that something different was going to happen and that had the potential uh, to upset our medical school. And not only our medical school, we never really envisaged that a year later we would be in our third wave and how the world has changed. On the 12th of March, uh, we had to close our Dublin campus. But there was swift action taken by Professor Kelly, Dean Hannah McGee and others in a decision to move our long case exams for our final med class a year early. And I still remember it well, walking into the final med class uh, seven weeks before their exams to say, actually, we're going to do the exams early. They're on in two weeks time. So they commenced on the 7th of March and uh, normally they will be held in mid to late April. Pretty shocking thing to be told. I remember in final med, if someone told me the exams were happening seven or eight weeks early, I would have been traumatized beyond belief. And in fact, I remember having spoken and given the message at looking at 300 students and looking at the shock. And of course, we'll never have 300 students in a room again. We also had our OSCE and our written exams moved online with proctoring and delivered to students, not just in Dublin, but to 500 of them across the globe in our three campuses. Now, normally if somebody asked our IT department, we want to do this, there would be a program, there would be processes, uh, business cases put forward, but there was no time for any of that. This all was done within the number of weeks. And uh, if I could congratulate Justin Ralph and his team on an extraordinary adaptation to getting us all to be used to technology. I remember saying late on in, in March saying I would never do the interviews for the forthcoming lecturers uh, online. I wanted to see who I was hiring face to face. And I was just told no. It was going to be online, it was unsafe. And now I'm the biggest fan of interviewing for consultant interviews online. I think it's such a waste of time to actually sit down and meet people. So I'm very, I'm a late adapter, but congratulations to Justin Ralph and forcing us to do things so fast. And last year, you know, we were very successful in graduating our students on time and they had their virtual graduation. Um, that's still not a perfect replacement. That's a downside of COVID. I think the virtual graduation, the RCSI did very well. They made an excellent virtual graduation, far better than the other medical schools who I happen to sneak in on and look at, but it's still, it's not the same thing. And I think students and their parents, when we get rid of COVID, we deserve to go back to a real graduation. So what happened in senior cycle one last year? Well, the students, when college closed in March, they still had two modules to complete. And congratulations to all our departments, Obzingani, Pete, Psychiatry, GP, and Medicine and Surgery, they all moved online. End of year written exams moved online with proctoring. And uh, if you were wise, you would have bought uh, shares in uh, these proctoring companies, because I think every university in the world did it. The uh, cost is shocking, but it's uh, if you look at all the other examinations around the globe, uh, HPAT this year is now online. The GAMSAT exam is online with proctoring. 
Uh, so those companies uh, did extremely well uh, in a short time frame. So our SC1 students, they actually uh, had to return to campus in August and September because we foolishly thought everything would be perfect. And after June and July, when COVID went very quiet and the numbers went very low, we thought we'd get back to normal. We never saw a second or indeed the third waves coming. So we plan to bring our students back in August and September in senior cycle one. And these are now the current final meds. And final med, we gave up the month of September to allow them to complete senior cycle one. So these students, they might have been online from March, but remember, they really had very little in terms of summer holidays. August was the start of knowledge for senior cycle two. September was completing senior cycle one. End of September is completing assessments and straight into senior cycle two. So clinical exams were held at the end of September and they progressed to senior cycle two in October. So you get the theme here that students had no breaks and continued. And I might also speak on behalf of our faculty as I'm one of them. The faculty had no breaks either. So it, it's been a long, hard slog. Intermediate cycle, well, the research projects moved to literature reviews. That was very straightforward. Musculoskeletal medicine and medicine and surgery lectures all moved online. And you get this sense that all years had this dramatic change. Online interactive small group meetings and tutorials were facilitated by tutors and actors. And this is something that was a real plus of COVID. In fact, students were now getting tutorials in groups of six or eight by senior uh, colleagues. So we had plenty of senior surgeons and physicians who retired who came in to help and great credit and thanks to them. But students were now getting a lot more small group tutorials than they might have been if there was no COVID. And the IC3 long case exams were performed by video link. That is extraordinary that that was all done, became the new norm. Foundation year, year one and IC1, all teaching, teaching was delivered online by a Blackboard collaborator. I was slow enough to get used to Microsoft Teams or Blackboard Collaborate when you started was so clunky. It's now normal and our grand rounds runs every week on Blackboard Collaborate. We teach our final meds now on Blackboard Collaborate wherever they are in the world. So all those years uh, had their exams managed online. And in case students have been disadvantaged by COVID, we had this concept of the super supplemental exam. So you kept doing the exam until you passed. That's a nice new concept and probably an appropriate one um, that you just keep doing it until you get it. And I think that's been uh, very helpful to our students. So in the summertime, we then wanted to prepare for return to clinical placements. And we remember June, July, we had this belief that it was gone. COVID was under control and we were planning to take our students back, just tidy up those clinical years who had missed time and we thought life would go back to normal. So there were numerous meetings throughout July and August, our undergraduate dean's meetings and hospital liaison meetings. And I remember meeting with Ian Carter. Um, and when Ian Carter makes a decision, you just say yes. And he agreed to let our students back in in August. But there were certain criteria that were required. Well, this is what we tried for July. The uh, requirements were that they were all COVID tested. At the time, we thought that was almost an outrageous requirement. It would be expensive. A COVID test to get it done commercially was 250 euros. We have 1800 students. If we were going to go down that line, it's going to be very expensive. I tried. I actually met with them and said, could we just do this on a selective basis? I was run out of the office. COVID testing was standard. It was going to be in part if you were going to arrive in Bowman or any RCSI hospital, you'd have to have a negative COVID test. And furthermore, the Bowman online education programs, he wanted every student to be completely trained in all the requirements. You might say totally reasonable, but he required it of all staff. And I can tell you, having done all the training courses myself, it's one and a half days of education of doing online courses. And this is now standard for all our students. I'm still surprised that the students didn't complain. I personally was 
very unhappy having to spend a day and a half doing online courses. But uh, the students were great. They just did them and uh, went through them. Um, I've yet to learn that when you're watching an educational video on YouTube, you don't watch it at normal speed. My children told me, just play it at twice the speed. It doubles um, half your time. So I, I've now learned that. Another benefit of COVID, my education. But we had to invent a system whereby a student coming to Beaumont every day would answer a questionnaire, say that they know symptoms, they were fit for coming to the hospital site, and then they had to record where they were. Again, Justin Ralph and the team in IT, extraordinary. They designed their own app for that. And finally, I have to congratulate Mary Louise Brennan, who provided access to the scrub machine in Bowman. And I talked one day to the man whose job it is to replace the scrubs in the machine. And he said he used to do this every second day. He now has three colleagues for each machine and they change them every three hours, restocking um, the scrub machines. So you can imagine if you worked for a company uh, that sells those uh, scrub machines, you'd have done well uh, as well. So from our July experience, where we knew that we could safely have students on site uh, with new protocols. Next thing was RCSI made a very wise decision that they would do the COVID swapping themselves. And indeed, great credit to Gian Piero Cavallari and his colleague Steve Kerrigan, who now have set up COVID testing for RCSI students and staff. And that's been real innovation. Um, and Roland Baxter and his colleagues who took up this uh, organizational extravaganza have made this so smooth. So our students um, have been swapped every time they change a clinical placement. So staff were trained in COVID swapping. They were trained in hand hygiene and donning and doffing PPE, wearing FFP2 masks delivered by an external provider. Moodle modules are created. We, they're my favorite ones, the ones that I had to do myself, hand hygiene and PPE. The Moodle clinical tracker was created. That's to monitor student movement. So if someone did become positive, we would be able to track the students. And the positivity rate among our students has been incredibly low. That's due to the discipline and the behavior of the students and the really effective monitoring that the college have done. And uh, Killian McGrogan, in our Mercer's Medical Center takes great credit for providing the education and the infrastructure to allow really good medical management of all our students. And finally, a new normal. We all wear RCSI crested scrubs. Uh, and thanks to Mary Louise Brennan and the team uh, in RCSI who actually made that happen. It actually makes them look well. So all students are turning to clinical placements. Uh, COVID testing was organized by RCSI. All training modules had to be completed on Moodle or BARS. BARS is the online system in Bowman. And they were provided with the appropriate PPE where it was needed on the clinical sites. And they had to wear scrubs. During this time, it has to be said, there were also students who volunteered for proning teams. Great credit. Uh, took up proning, which is turning our patients in the intensive care unit to help them get over uh, the respiratory compromise uh, by lying on one's back. So they really did a superb job. There were students who volunteered from that. So in planning for the academic year this year, 2020-21, the COVID control admin team identified that we would have new campuses. And our biggest change was we actually had to rent Crow Park for year two because you can't be socially distanced. I remember the arguments one meter versus two meter and great credit to Carl Kelly said, it's two meters, let's be safe. And where we needed more space, we rented it in Crow Park. And that's been a great success in terms of providing really safe educational space uh, for a whole cohort of, of our IC2 uh, and year two students. And of course, September to December last year was when we actually had, because we we're changing our curriculum, two classes were getting the same 
program at one time. So it was double teaching. And Nye Hughes did a tremendous job in organizing that. And it's gone really, really well. And we now are finishing the second semester in Crow Park. But it's been a superb uh, way to keep the students in a particular hub and to avoid transmission of COVID between the years. So we've kept all our students in learning communities and in specific hubs so that the rate of transmission is reduced significantly. That in itself is a master plan of excellence. So foundation year, we're on Stevens Green. Year one was 26 York Street. Gem one, we're in Mercer. Gem two in Connolly. SC one, we're on their specialist hospital sites. And SC two, we're in Beaumont. So SC1 students commenced our program in October, but we had to reduce it to six weeks to catch up and fit everything in within the year. SC2 students, um, they had a lot of their material online, as we know, in August. And then one other challenge was that our North American colleagues had all their overseas electives cancelled. And we thought we were doing OK until in true Irish fashion, we all decided at Christmas that we would hug and share and do the usual family gatherings at Christmas. And guess what happened? Wave three arrived. And my goodness, it was unprecedented. There were 8,000 cases a day. Um, so clearly access to our RCSI hospital sites had to be shut. Um, our hospitals were undergoing a phenomenal uh, wave of COVID infections. It was unsafe for the students. And we couldn't have it that our students were, would be getting infected and uh, unwell with COVID because of the serious risk uh, of the serious illness that can occur. So the unprecedented rise in COVID-19 cases has left us as a medical school with our final med class with 338 students, over 300 are off clinical campuses. We're at Drada, Connolly, Bowman, Waterford, Kenny. The only places where we're still allowed students, the small number in the bonds, a small number in Black Rock, Mullingar and Cavan and Inniskill. The rest are over 300 students are without clinical access as we speak. And great credit to our lecturers and tutors who rapidly innovated. And I mean, over a weekend when this happened uh, in early January, um, they designed three new programs, a new clinical simulation program, so online war rounds with actors, uh, Professor McElvaney and a surgical tutor teaching. I've doubled my teaching program uh, to ensure more clinical teaching is provided. And we're now at the stage we're going to have to modify the assessments planned. So it looks likely that our end of February, which would normally be a long case, uh, we'll be back to doing it on a computer uh, with an actor. And we're now making plans that it, it may be that our students may graduate without getting proper examination skills, our procedural skills assessments. And we've now designed a new program in Beaumont and in number 26 in Stevens Green, where they'll get taught their clinical exam skills and assessed likewise for procedural skills. So if graduation happens, without a physical exam, we will know that they're competent in these key um, exams. SC1 in January, ENT and ophthalmology went online. And fortunately, all other SC1 students uh, are actually in our specialty hospitals in OBS, gynae, PED, psychiatry and GP. They're managing very well. So we're very, very pleased uh, with, that there are still they have low risks, as low volumes of COVID in their office and gynae hospitals. GP practice is a great challenge because GP practice has been decimated by COVID, but they have arranged specific learning activities for our GPs. Our psychiatrists again are coping. And the number, the COVID volume in psychiatry institutions has been relatively low, and likewise in, in pediatrics. So that is a small mercy for us. So let's look back. What has worked um, with COVID? Well, things that have been really good is that communication has been enhanced with all classes. And this has really changed since before. So there's regular year-led MS Teams meetings. I meet our final med class once a month at a minimum, 
and often uh, more frequent. And in fact, they'd rather not meet me more frequently because every time I meet them, there's another significant change. So any meeting with Professor Hill or the head of school um, is a nervous one because it usually means there's a significant change. So I'm trying to reduce it to once a month. There's a Dean's monthly newsletter. There's a CEO monthly webinar. So communication is much better. What else has COVID done? Well, the IT infrastructure, the ability to get us all on teams, the ability to keep us uh, working from home, uh, although it hasn't happened in, in our myself and my clinical colleagues, uh, I've regarded Beaumont as our new home uh, because of the need to continue clinical care and also to teach. The ability to adapt swiftly though it has been extraordinary and how colleges manage to do everything online. I, in fact, feel sorry um, for our senior management team who are working from home. And I, I would find that really frustrating. I regard it as a real distinct uh, joy and that I'm allowed to get out of the house every day um, and, and get to Beaumont. Being locked up with uh, three triplet sons, I think, would be uh, very, very difficult. Staff and students at RCSI adapted to change and, and mastered Blackboard Collaborate, Microsoft Teams incredibly well. Uh, there's been a swift and collegiate response to all challenges. So whatever challenge comes up, there's an answer of just how do we fix it? And that's the spirit of RCSI, which I think has been incredible. One other concern that we had uh, last May was would the students come back at all? Would we get our new um, students in year one? Well, in typical RCSI fashion, not only did we get them all back, we got more than we needed. So uh, an incredible recruitment drive and Philip Curtis and his team did an amazing job there. But something that would be critical if, if, if our students did not arrive into year one, we'd have significant challenges for the years ahead. So what are the challenges? Well, delivering clinical teaching with reduced access has made us really be inventive. Um, so we have utilized um, teaching in uh, off-site outpatient facilities. So over Christmas, I did clinics in Omni Shopping Centre, special breast clinics, and uh, we worked all day, 28th and 29th of December, and we were seeing 80 patients a day, and we had a sign up of students, 160 final men volunteered. Now we can only take 40, but 160 said they wanted to do those clinics. So we're, we're pushing innovation. Any access site we get, we will uh, use it. The college have met up to the challenge of remote working. And in fact, this is becoming a new norm. Next challenge is when we get our students vaccinated. And I would be very hopeful it will be March, April. In fact, our graduating class really can't graduate without being vaccinated. They will be top of the list. Uh, but there are challenges. Um, I understand the supply of the AstraZeneca vaccine, the Oxford vaccine, has now been reduced within Europe. Um, and that's because I think they want to ensure that it's given to all countries at a similar time and not uh, favour Europe and North America over third world countries. And then the other challenges, we were living in the first wave and in the second wave thinking, that's it. And we think now when the third wave is over, that'll be it and we can plan to get back to normal. But it looks like wearing face masks will stay. Um, and it looks like we're now getting legislation that working from home will be the new norm. So when you look at the preclinical SAR office on the first floor, very large space, and if you think that that will never be full again, the clinical SAR office in Beaumont will never be full because the new norm might be, and probably will be, to work from home. Uh, massive changes um, for RCSI ahead, and indeed all of society. So it's unknown as to when COVID will end. So what about the future of medical education? This is my last slide. But I want to tell you, we have a new medical curriculum plan for 2022, and it's full of innovation. There's so many things uh, that COVID has been beneficial to allow us to start this program uh, of this new medical curriculum. 
there will be more coaching in this new medical curriculum. And we've actually enhanced the personal tutor role uh, in the last year because of COVID. There will be learning communities and we've automatically overnight created learning communities. And we think we can expand that and get them to their full potential, whereby you're essentially in six small medical schools and, and six learning communities uh, for each year. And I think that will be helpful for education. The coaching will be different, that there'll be much more interaction, small group teaching. We've already seen how in third med, in IC3, we so much more small group teaching. That will become the norm. And there's no reason why we shouldn't benefit from more of that online teaching. Um, so the benefits of COVID, the learning communities, they're already established. The focus on key competencies. So the graduating class this year know there are six examination skills they have to be competent on. They're being taught it over the next three weeks, they're being assessed it over the following two weeks, and they will be deemed competent. Likewise, for procedural skills, they know they have to be able to put in a urinary catheter, take blood, take blood cultures, put in a, a, a venflon. They can't do them. They know they're not going to graduate. That focus on key competencies on procedural skills and clinical exam skills is really focused. And that's new for this year's final med class. And that's something that we wish to have in our new curriculum. I think we've all adapted to the online assessment. I don't see you're going into the exam hall to do a multiple choice exam again. That wonderful exam hall we have will probably be for major events, but I don't see it at exam time where we sit down and do um, MCQ exams. An interesting thing was that North America, the USMLE, asked us to do the clinical component of the Step 2 exam this year. So the concept of all our students flying to North America for a clinical exam done in Bournemouth this year, will that stay? We hope. Wasn't it wonderful that our students applying for residencies in North America did not spend several thousand euros flying across North America for 10 to 15 interviews? That clearly was carbon unfriendly and exhausting for our students that they would spend a month or sometimes two months flying around doing interviews. Skype, Microsoft Teams, whatever method is used, is definitely better than flying around the world to do interviews for 10, 15 minutes. Another thing that we do is we record the online clinical assessments. That ensures fairness. So when I couldn't fly to Bahrain and couldn't fly to Perdana last year, I could review the online clinical assessments and the marking and check that the standards were right. And that's going to become the new norm. So we might have 60 examiners in the final med exam, but we now know that the standardization because we've recorded all the assessments, something we just never did before. Another benefit, external examiners will not travel anymore. Lorna Marson is our extern and she is in for this year and last year and she was in Edinburgh and evaluated the standards of the clinical performance of our students doing their exams via a laptop and seeing exactly what went on, the communication skills, the examination technique and the knowledge, and was able to say that is the appropriate mark or not. And I must say I've done a lot of traveling as an extern and I don't regret that in the future uh, that won't be necessary. So that will become normal and that's a benefit. Another benefit of COVID is RCSI has demonstrated phenomenal ability to change rapidly. And, I, and I, that is really uh, amazing. Teams like the COVID admin control team, um, the fact that we managed uh, at Christmas um, to look after our students who were recommended to stay here in Dublin. And another benefit of COVID has been there's been more communication and more feedback with students. And I think that's the key to education, greater engagement with students with smaller numbers in, in, in those groups. And, and they are the benefits of COVID. And I've no doubt that COVID has changed the world. Yes, we might be wearing masks, 
forevermore. We will change how we practice clinically. And indeed, our students were preparing them for this world of COVID. But I think it's going to be a very, very different world. But I think RCSI are right at the front and ready to educate despite the phenomenal restrictions. If someone told me last year that 90% of the final med class would not have access to patients, I would think it was the end of the world and that you could not graduate them safely. But in fact, the more I meet with our final med students, I think they're extremely well prepared. And I've no doubt that they'll make excellent doctors and we look forward to having them uh, as interns in our hospitals. So I'm going to finish with that. And I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Hill, for that excellent and very thought provoking with us lecture, which I thoroughly enjoyed and I'm sure the audience did too. There will be time for questions later after the other uh, presentations and we look forward to those. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce the first of our guest speakers, Professor Sam McConkie, who will be speaking on the very topical issue of COVID vaccination. Professor McConkie is Deputy Dean and Head of the Department of International Health and Tropical Medicine at the RPI. He is a consultant in tropical medicine, infectious disease and general internal medicine at Beaumont Hospital and Our Lady of Lourdes Hospital, Goda. Most of you will know Professor McConkie from his regular informative interaction with the media during this pandemic. So thank you very much, Professor McConkie, and welcome. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor McConnell Walsh, and also President Yu. Um, can I just get confirmation that my sound is doing okay? It's fine. Okay, thank you. Thanks for this invitation uh, to talk about vaccines. Uh, I um, haven't spoken much um, on the public media about vaccines, but that, that is my background in research, uh, both before coming to RCSI and also doing uh, phase one studies of um, essentially adenoviral vectored vaccines for malaria here using the same platforms that we'll talk about in a few minutes. I'm going to very briefly uh, outline for you uh, hopefully with some scientific insight, the options that um, are really being talked about to a huge extent in the media. It's a privilege now to hear so much talk about uh, safety profiles and phase three studies from people who really hadn't known was such a thing as a phase two or three study in the past. I'm going to talk a little bit about the context of where we're at very briefly, then look at the stages before phase three, then most of my talk is focusing on these four types of delivery systems that have brought to phase three studies and in some cases to licensing some really exciting and very positive products of which there are nine or ten of them at this stage. So it's not just one or two. Thankfully, there, there are many more uh, successful looking products. And I'm going to end then uh, with with what we don't know yet. It's the caveats, the uh, the unknowns, uh, which I feel we have to keep in mind. Uh, the man in the picture here is called David Turrell. I had the privilege of meeting him at a seminar in Oxford before I came here. He discovered the first coronavirus in uh, um, the Salisbury in uh, 1965. He ran the common cold unit and used to inoculate people for many years famously uh, with other people's sort of snot and then they got the common cold and through that he discovered rhinoviruses, some adenoviruses and coronaviruses. It was jokingly said about him that despite studying it for many, many years, he never led to a cure for the common cold and he was perhaps made fun of. He pioneered these challenge studies, uh, which many of us have used for other uh, diseases and potentially for coronavirus. As you see, there's a whole string of them. The third one down in the list, 2003 SARS from bats, that uh, really uh, hit Asia in a ferocious way and was completely controlled and suppressed at that time successfully in about 15 Asian countries. That led those countries to have a really thorough detailed SARS plan, which unfortunately we in Ireland, we just had one case in uh, Balneslow, I believe. The person had flown in from Hong Kong, was promptly put in a room because we said, oh, maybe they've got um, 
uh, coronavirus and no secondary cases in Ireland occurred. So we had really good, uh, thoughtful doctors and nurses in Ballinasloe who promptly put the person into isolation uh, and that successfully controlled and prevented any further spread in Ireland. Sadly, we, we've not done that uh, successfully with SARS-2, where a person was lying for two or three weeks in hospital, infecting hundreds of others uh, before they were diagnosed. There are several other common cold viruses, and then 2019, we have SARS, cov 2 The other ones cause the common cold and otitis media. They occur in epidemics every two or three years. You don't get lifelong immunity to the others, so that's why I fear that the uh, vaccine and natural immunity won't last forever. It's a big virus, um, relatively good RNA dependent RNA polymerase with a low error rate, but we know every two to four weeks there's some variation in the genome. So you can use molecular epidemiology to trace variants. There have been thousands of variants. There's a bit of nationalism creeping in and people saying, oh, there's a British variant. There's a South African variant. There's a British variant. I feel that's very wrong of us to use those terms. We should say B117. And there have actually been thousands of variants so far. So this is a diverse RNA virus, like a swarm, not like a single genome. And it's relatively easy to kill with, you know, alcohol, bleach, detergents. It's a lipid, lipid, you can see the electron micrograph of it. The epidemic, as we know, started in Wuhan, developed pneumonia. It was sequenced, and they told us the sequence on the 20th of January, big increase in cases. We learned that being on a cruise ship for isolation doesn't work. And now we've had waves and waves of illness and death, 2.2 uh, million deaths worldwide so far. So un unimaginable to most people uh, back in, in January. And in England, uh, there, there typically are about 20 deaths per million people per day in the normal run of things. And now, unfortunately, at this time today, there are 18 extra deaths per million uh, because of uh, SARS-2 coronavirus. So this has led to a doubling of the usual deaths in England. For strange reasons that I don't understand, it's less of an impact in Af Africa, perhaps because of a younger population, but it still seems more than that, perhaps because the immune system is more switched on. Uh, I have been doing a lot of political and media engagement, as Professor Hill kindly said, and I've been trying to share that 1.6 billion people in the world in Asia have controlled this. This can be completely controlled. Sadly, we have not done that in Ireland. We've not done it in Britain. We've not done it in America or no country in Europe, uh, except for maybe uh, Faroe Islands, arguably could be in Europe or Guernsey uh, have controlled it. But th that is where I hope we get to soon. And I'm trying to do what I can in terms of medium politics to get us there. So looking at vaccines, uh, there are about 160 preclinical conceptual products, 60 of which have gone into some clinical trials. I'm really only going to focus the rest of this talk on the 10 that are identified there as in phase three trials or licensed. I like the diversity of technologies and I'll try and share a bit of the science with you. There's a completely new technology here, which is messenger RNA that's been stabilized and modified a bit to make it more stable and then wrapped up in a lipid bilayer in a nanoparticle and delivered by needle into the muscle, developed by uh, a couple that I'll, I'll talk about. They developed it as a cure for cancer. So many of these technologies will probably be breakthroughs in other areas as well as COVID-19. Um, the second one is adenoviral vectored vaccines, which, as I said, we've used here in first in human studies in Dublin and Beaumont. There are five products like that. Some companies are using inactivated whole virus. That's really old Pasteur traditional technology. Grow the virus, inactivate it, add some adjuvant like alum and then try it out. And uh, an American company is uh, with good phase three results, has released a recombinant protein vaccine. So those are the four broad conceptual ones. We've heard most about the Pfizer one uh, because that's uh, really the, 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 the first one to, to get to market. It uses this messenger RNA technology. The technology was invented and developed by two doctors originally ethnically from Turkey working in Germany, doctors Terici and Sahan in, in a company called BioNTech. And they've been using this for anti-cancer immunotherapy rather than for infectious disease. So this product has been developed by anti-cancer researchers who spent 25, 30 years of their career developing anti-cancer products and then applied the same technology successfully, it turns out, uh, much more successfully than many of us had expected uh, to, um, uh, to, to, to coronavirus. Uh, 
when you develop something, you need a big industrial partner like Pfizer to manufacture lots of it and to market it and sell it and do the phase three trials. The plant that you see in the picture there is in West Dublin. It's Grange Castle, just beyond Clondalkin. That road you're seeing in the side is the M50 and the mountains in the background are the Wicklow Mountains. The biggest selling vaccine in the world is a Prevnar pneumococcal vaccine and it's made in Dublin. So by Pfizer. It was originally developed by a company called Wyeth and then Pfizer bought them. So this is a little lipid particle. They've given it a big study of uh, 43,000 volunteers. So these are very large uh, clinical trials, which gives us good confidence about the safety and about the efficacy of these products. And uh, the efficacy was good. In a New England Journal publication, they've shown uh, half the people got vaccine, only eight of them got COVID, whereas 162 of the same number of control group uh, got COVID, which translates into 95% efficacy. It looks it's good for severe disease. It's also that quite a proportion of those patients, or sorry, volunteers were elderly. So it seems to work in the elderly reasonably well also, which as you know, has been a point of contention for some of the other products. It has been licensed in the EU, and of course it's been rolled out in Ireland. And many of us have had it. It's a good safety record. After the second dose, you get a bit of fever and a sore arm. I don't know, those of us in the game of vaccine development feel that's a good thing because you get a more immune response, but certainly has left some fairly robust surgeons that I know in the bed when they should have been operating on the day after the vaccine. So it can certainly uh, uh, cause some uh, loss of activity daily living uh, the day after the vaccine, then they got better and were fine. It's relatively expensive to make, complex little thing, and you have to store it at minus 70 or minus 80, so it doesn't lend itself to every GP platform. Then Moderna essentially is an American company that's using the same technology, technology transfer, same idea of stabilized mRNA, same spike protein with some little variants to keep it stable, same little lipid particle. They got a lot of money from NAAID and ran through very quick clinical trials. And again, very, very similar results, 94%, which is basically the same. They had 11 cases in the vaccinated group versus 185 in the control group. So that's that's an impressive uh, sort of difference. Happily severe cases were also very well protected. Uh, they also had uh, good data from the over 65s and uh, it was licensed in the USA on the 18th of December. It, it do doesn't need the same cold chain. In fact, the Pfizer vaccine may not need the, the cold chain, just they haven't done the stability uh, data yet to show it's stable. So the Moderna one is okay in the fridge for a month. 38 euros per dose needs two doses. So it's not cheap. This is a for-profit company and they're probably going to try and make some money. Then uh, moving on to adenoviral vector vaccines, uh, one developed by Oxford University, they partnered with a big Swedish and British company called AstraZeneca. Um, I'll throw in a plug here, the two people that developed it, I, I know both personally and uh, Adrian Hill in the bottom corner is, is actually, I'll say, Professor Hill's brother. So I'm, I'll tell some family secrets about Professor Hill. And Sarah Gilbert is a molecular virologist who uh, stitches the thing together. Uh, uh, Adrian developed and, and, and runs the program. So they came up with this uh, uh, vectored vaccine that worked for MERS, worked for SARS. Uh, we, I've worked with this group for many years and they've got good vaccines against malaria, trials against melanoma, which I did first in humans didn't really work so well for melanoma. So you see again the link between infectious disease and cancer and immunotherapy for cancer, I'm hoping will be uh, a growing solution to people with cancer. I spent uh, three years in Gambia before coming to RCSI side doing hep B trials of this uh, product. Um, this was licensed in the UK in December and then in uh, January, hopefully today in the EU. I haven't heard yet. I put that in today, uh, 29th of January, but I haven't actually seen the result yet. Um, it's about 74%, 7.4% effective. And um, there's a controversy going on because the German uh, authorities said that maybe it's not so effective in over 65s, but it's more that we don't know. The trials haven't been done. It, it, it may actually work in that group. Um, it's a bit cheaper and it only needs the fridge, so it's easier to transport. It's an attenuated chimpanzee adenoviral vector and the S protein, this famous spike protein. Now, Sputnik 5. Sputnik, as I'm sure most of you know, was the first attempt to go into space. The Russians and the Americans were in a big space race, and the Russians won and got into orbital 
human being into orbit first, and that was called Sputnik 1. So they've called this vaccine Sputnik 5. There is a sort of a bit of nationalism going on in all this infectious disease. Unfortunately, infectious disease lend themselves to, sadly, xenophobia and friction with foreigners and treating people who are different from you badly. And of course, I consistently stand against that as a person and as a scientist. And it's also irrational um, because it's through international collaboration and working together that we'll actually solve this problem, not through fighting with each other, either us with Northern Ireland or people in Northern Ireland, one with the other, or us with Britain. In general, you, we have to reach negotiated compromises uh, to work through all these problems. So the Moscow one turns out to be very similar in some ways to the Oxford one, a similar vector, except it's human adenovirus. And they use two different vectors, one for the first dose and then a different vector for the second dose, which theoretically makes a lot of sense. It's the same antigen. Uh, the phase two studies looked OK. So the Russians licensed it back in August on the basis of tiny phase two studies without any efficacy data. So does it work? Well, we don't know. It, they haven't really been very open with the uh, data. Uh, so it's it's really uh, they rushed it through and wanted to have the first uh, sort of vaccine licensed in the world. My head likes it. I, the, 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 in theory, it seems like a good idea. But I, I feel we should do the big phase three trials first and then only license it and put things on the market after we've done that. Once, once you lose your processes of what is truth, then things become really more murky. So Johnson and Johnson uh, have another uh, adenoviral vectored vaccine. They had one against Ebola, which worked. And this one for SARS looks 66 percent effective. It's a different adenovirus, adenovirus 5, I'm sorry, adenovirus 26. Um, and it's got rolling review with EMEA. I'm expecting that it will um, come on the market in Europe in the next four weeks or so. Uh, they have a very big phase three trial, 40, 43,000 people, a little bit of AEs, but it looks like it works uh, about 66% effective, but 85% against severe disease. And it works against the B117 variant from Essex and Kent and the B.351 uh, variant that was found in South Africa. Uh, the, there's a Chinese adenoviral 5 vectored vaccine uh, uh, called Condidisa, uh, made by Beijing Institute of Biotechnology and CanSino. Uh, this, again, there's very little data out in it, seems to have good immunity. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about another uh, Chinese vaccine in a moment because quite a few people, in RCSI students in Bahrain and UAE may have had it, but I don't believe this is the one they've had. I think it's the other uh, inactivated Chinese vaccine that's been very widely used. This is an Indian Serum Institute of India are manufacturing essentially like the Oxford vaccine through a technology transfer. They're bulk manufacturing in massive volumes, the Oxford vaccine. And uh, there was a fire at this plant, but they say it hasn't affected production. So I'm hoping it won't because the Indian capacity to make large volumes of vaccine is, is huge. And that's obviously there's a supply chain problem. So a manufacturing facility like the uh, Serum Institute of India with a very good reputation of making large numbers of doses in the past. Uh, would, would be a great asset to people all around the world. Then uh, uh, Bharat Biotech, an Indian biotech company, have developed their own uh, made in India, developed in India vaccine. And this is an inactivated virus. So growing virus in cell culture and then killing it off, adding some alum. And we haven't seen the phase three data yet. There's uh, 26,000 people in a study, some in Bangladesh, some in uh, Gujarat. Uh, it's likely cheap. It looks like you can sort it in a fridge. So this could also be another really helpful product. The second Chinese vaccine I mentioned is called Sinovac, and many students in the Middle East may have had it. Lots of the trials were done in Bahrain and UAE. It looks variable data that's never been published, and it isn't really a full report out there. Unfortunately, a lot of the news media are building stories on press releases. So you don't have a method section of your paper. You don't have details of how they defined COVID. Is it severe disease? Is it all disease? Is it all infection? Is it deaths? So comparing these efficacy results, as you see, are very different from Brazil, Turkey and Indonesia because we don't have the methods. So I'm struggling in my analysis because the companies have been quite uh, private about the details. It's a killed virus with alum uh, from Sinovac Life Sciences in Beijing. Sinopharm then also is a kill virus grown on viracells. 
gain 10 million doses given, and this has been widely used in the Puritan Darien and the Puritan UAE, uh, so uh, very widely used in the Gulf. Lastly, I'll talk about Novavax. This is a different type of vaccine. They've used recombinant insect cells, baccalaurovirus cells, to make the S protein. So they're manufacturing a protein, a bit like how the hepatitis B vaccine that all of us have had is made as a synthetic protein. And then they've added in this patented adjuvant. Uh, they don't tell us much about what it is, some sort of uh, saponin matrix M that, that somehow um, uh, stimulates toll like receptor seven and eight. So it's a proprietary adjuvant that's a bit secret. There's a press release a day or two ago saying it's 89% effective, and the EU are in a rolling review and, and talking about licensing it. Apologies. They're also, uh, it works against the variants. It looks uh, reasonably safe. We don't know about the cost of it. So, uh, Sam the pessimist, how long does the vaccine last for? Well, nobody knows. Many of them last four to six months, but do they go for a year or two? We don't know. How frequently will we need another dose? Again, we don't know. Most importantly, will they work in the elderly? Because SARS and COVID is a disease of the vulnerable, the immunocompromised, sick people and elderly. And unfortunately, some of these vaccine studies are mainly done in people between 18 and 65. So we don't really know yet if they will be as effective in the elderly. And unfortunately, many vaccines are less effective in older people. Will it work in immunocompromised or how well? Unfortunately, many don't work when people don't have a good immune system or dialysis patients for a moment we find a lot of morbidity and mortality. Then the big question, how quickly will 16 billion doses be made and distributed? So you need two doses. There's 8 billion people in the world. This is a worldwide problem. And at present we see these, I would call it nationalistic bun fights, where every country is having an argument with their neighbor saying, we want more doses, not you. We want to take your doses. And you can see this happening. So this isn't going to help things. We just need to work together to make as many doses as we can. But the manufacturing and distribution is a real challenge. Then can you give minus 80 stored products in rural areas? And how should we fairly allocate the doses worldwide? I'll leave those open. I don't have the answers. So I'm going to say uh, thank you for this opportunity to talk to you. Uh, it's, it's, it's really a privilege. Thank you very much. Professor McConkey for that excellent presentation. I'm sure there will be many questions for you later. So it now gives me great pleasure to introduce our second guest speaker, Dr. Owen Debarra, who will be presenting on discussing the COVID pandemic. Dr. Debarra is a consultant in infectious diseases at Beaumont Hospital and senior lecturer at the RCSI. He has worked tirelessly during the pandemic managing patients with COVID-19 at Beaumont Hospital. Most of you will also know Dr. Debarra from his numerous interviews with the media, giving very informative updates on the COVID pandemic. So thank you very much for attending Dr. Debarra and you're very welcome. Good evening. My name is Owen DeBarra. I'm a consultant in infectious disease at Bowman Hospital. I'm a senior lecturer with the Department of International Health and Tropical Medicine at RCSI. Thanks to the organising committee for inviting me to uh, talk this evening and thanks to letting, for letting them, me uh, record this um, in advance in case I can't manage to join you, but I will join you for the Q&A. So I'm going to take you through a brief walkthrough of my perspective on the pandemic um, and a little bit on my own journey through it. I guess this part needs really no introduction. A little over a year ago, most of us knew very little. In fact, nobody in the world knew anything much about SARS-CoV-2 or novel coronavirus as it then was. Uh, and so much has changed since that time. For me, uh, it's five, a year and five days ago since I assessed my first suspect case, a man from Wuhan. I didn't appreciate just how many links there were between Dublin and Wuhan at that time. But um, myself and the Infectious Disease Service at Beaumont took on to see any of those suspects directly at that time. 
we saw over 140 patients with travel to Wuhan, from Wuhan before we got to the positive cases who were in fact traveling from Italy. And that was the 9th of March last year. And of course, most people know what flowed thereafter. Thinking about doing this, I was thinking about the daydreams that I had some 17 or 18 years ago when I was a medical student in RCSI, dreaming about being a, an adventurous doctor in some far-flung part of the world, <clears throat> and maybe talking to media about what we were trying to do and contain. And this is me traveling illegally between Thailand and Myanmar to work in a TB program. But I didn't realize at that stage that my real media piece, and that would be me sitting in my own living room on national television in my own country. So all these things can happen and uh, life does have surprising twists for us all. A couple of overarching things about the last year. One is that the word of the year for me was ultra crepidarian, which comes from the Greek above the, uh, the shoe leather, uh, supposedly attributed to uh, um, Apollo's uh, or Apelles, a famous uh, Greek painter who when painting a portrait, a shoemaker came up to him and uh, commented that he could have made a better job on the, uh, on the sandals. And um, to that, Apelles was very grateful, thanked the shoemaker for enhancing his work. But emboldened by this, the shoemaker went on to say, well, actually, you should change some of the other aspects of the painting, uh, to which Apelles replied, well, to the shoemaker, his last, and we shouldn't speak beyond their station. And for me, that goes to the next graphic, which is about the linkages of all the different aspects. And that's about multidisciplinary working, which you learn about, really is how we practice and how we should practice. Um, for me, as an ID physician, a lot of my role has been trying to do that interconnectedness that because I'm a clinician who sees patients, but also has a better understanding of the laboratory bit of public health, of occupational health, of what challenges my surgical colleagues have, of the management of the hospital, all of these things. Um, so it's been involved in, in daily meetings at local level, hospital level, national level and beyond, trying to link all of the skills, experiences of people to get the best outcome for the system and for the patient. So that's something that we take forward. The second bit is how this has been a dichotomy of evidence-based medicine, which is absolutely what we should be doing. We should have the evidence. We should inform that with clinical judgment and patient aspects. What should we really do that's a best benefit to the patient and certainly no harm versus the precautionary principle, which is applied to environmental issues and to public health issues, whereby we don't have enough evidence to say that you know, global warming is caused by greenhouse gas emissions say in the past, but many countries decided that we had to take action because the consequences of not were so dire. And similarly, in trying to prevent an infectious disease with a, you know, a high mortality rate, some things we had to do when we didn't have the evidence on that precautionary principle. But then there's other areas that are less clear, and I'll get to that when we talk about treatments. So this is all about change. Um, you know, we used to be all focused on, on Wuhan and then it was Northern Italy and pretty quickly it became North County Dublin. As I said, we saw nearly 150 people before we found a case and that was through a small infectious disease team taking over an ITU or HDU bed to see people completely separately. And we operated as a hub for public health. They sent the patients in directly to us. And then, of course, once things started to take off, then they, they really took off. This is the epi curve by epidemiologic date rather than by notification date of cases in that first wave. And you can see it wasn't so much a peak as a plateau. And I suspect that's the same this round. But of course, the figures we get on the television are the peak figures of notification, not the date of epidemiology, the date of symptoms or even of the test. But that often changes things a little bit. And we'll see that in June course. This was a uh, the 2nd of February, I was called into the hospital late on a Saturday night because an airplane was landing at Dublin Airport with a man from Wuhan via Moscow who was unwell. This got a lot of media attention. Everyone thought he was in the National Isolation Unit. He wasn't. He was with us in Bumwood Hospital uh, and he was one of our early suspects. Of course, even the man before that, we had no test. We had him in isolation. He was perfectly well, but protective isolation for the country pending a test that had to be sent to the UK. 
fairly promptly was the realization that we needed to do more and we need to do things differently. I found a stairwell at the back of the hospital and we set up the first testing pod in the country and we made it a drive through testing pod. We needed, needed it to be that flexible. And again, at this point in time, we were doing things for the public health side, not just the hospital. But of course, quite quickly, that transferred over into the hospital. And this was the army that were brought in to help us build the tents and facilities that's staffed by RCSI graduates, physician associates, and continues to this day and continues to facilitate um, time sensitive surgery, uh, elective admissions, and rapid turnaround staff testing. That staff can raise their hand, get a test by booking online themselves on their phone, and know their status really within a very short time frame. Of course, that's a big piece of this, was how do we protect our own staff? Healthcare worker rates around the world in any epidemic are always disproportionately high early on as people grapple with sick patients, grapple with PPE, grapple with modes of transmission. And it's very difficult for healthcare workers to sort of stand back. And to this day, cardiac arrest teams going, but maybe not always doing the PPE, but we need them to protect themselves first. And of course, now we have game changing vaccines and Sam's talked about them, but it remains to be seen just how good they will be. Happily, this trend is reversing again with the onset of vaccines and with heightened control measures. There'll be huge changes in how we actually do work. This is Rachel Moore, one of the physician associates students in Beaumont. We deployed a system using an app and a pulse oximeter to monitor COVID patients at home, watch when their SATs might dip and then bring them in for assessment or admission. Uh, scalable technologies that can be repurposed to other areas in the future. And of course, remote clinics done in many, many different ways. We also strove and managed to do research alongside the first wave and continue to do so. This is just some of the data of the first wave of the first 400 patients we had in terms of odds ratio for a poor outcome. And that poor outcome being the worst of death. So being male, nearly a fourfold or over a fourfold increase, having underlying respiratory disease, diabetes not found to be in our case, but the big ones, dementia or nosocomial transmission. And that really reflects frailty. If you were in hospital already, you were sick with something else, you were frail. They are the people who really did very poorly for this. And that's not so surprising because that's the group that do poorly with pretty much every infectious disease. But it continues and should inform vaccination strategies, prevention measures. As we see uh, nursing homes around the world, hospital settings around the world. I was invited early on to advise the Canadian Expert Review Board on nursing home response, because just like we had a bit of line of sight to China and a little bit of line of sight to Italy, they had from us. So we informed their practice before it ever hit them. And that's the kind of joined up learning from others that's happened globally during this pandemic. I used to say if there was one thing I could have tattooed on my chest or on a t-shirt in March and April last year is how long is this virus infectious for? And there were so many things that we just didn't know the answers to at the time. Um, now we know an awful lot more about modes of transmission. Like anything, it's a natural system. There will be some exceptions to this, but the majority of this is droplet, droplet transmitted. And of course, the new variants mean that people shed a bit more virus for a given level of infection, and the affinity of the virus to bind to ACE2 receptors is somewhat greater, so there's greater infectivity. But it means that there are standard procedures and measures that can prevent this, but it's about being scrupulous with them, not leaving any room for error. And we knew, we, we know that largely past day nine or 10 of symptoms, it's very unlikely to recover non-infectious virus, but it's not impossible. And this is a report from two weeks ago in the New England Journal of shedding a viable virus after immunosuppressive therapy for cancer. And one person in this 20 person patient uh, group shed virus up to 61 days after onset. And I'm sure we'll see more of this we're cautious with our renal transplant patients, patients and other immunosuppressive therapies as to just how long they shed viable virus. Again, this isn't a surprise. We see this with other viruses, with people who had uh, immunosuppressive T cell depleting therapies in particular. And again, there are many reasons why this is a pandemic, but this is the iceberg of infection, which is common to so many things. There's a large number of invisible carriers or palsy or asymptomatic infections. There's clinical illness and then there's those peak where there's death or mortality or if you like ITU admission. And whereas we can fairly easily identify, test, 
um, those visible cases. The invisible ones are very hard to do. And there's very few jurisdictions that have really tried to get down beneath the water level to those. Uh, whether that's the widespread use of, of antigen testing or widespread asymptomatic testing like the REACT study in the UK to try to determine how much virus is really out there. But that remains a, a huge challenge because unless we can address that, we're only ever treading water at the top with those symptomatic and identified ones. The type of test we use um, has its challenges, and you're probably aware of this. I remember sitting in meetings in March when we didn't have a test, and we wanted to get a machine, and the CEO was saying, me, what machine should we get? And we just had to go out and buy it, even though it wasn't a validated test in this jurisdiction for this test, but we needed something. And often this has been a story of, we need something, no matter how incomplete uh, it might be, it's better than nothing. But there's always a bit of an interpretation around how good that is and how much utility it's going to be. And now PCR may be somewhat flawed in that we find virus that is probably not infectious. And maybe other modalities will address that. More data on viral culture and maybe antigen when it might through serial testing pick up infectious virus rather than the people that just have some PCR positivity still. For now, it's PCR testing. And then therapeutics. Really, we still have no effective or appropriate therapy. Um, and this is an area where evidence-based medicine was really critical. There were so many preprint publications and uh, social media concerns or excitement about various therapies. And hydroxychloroquine ultimately caused more harm to the patients than good. Even in those placebo-controlled trials, there was a higher rate of cardiac death through arrhythmias. But it was so much promoted by, by many. So we needed to maintain that scientific rigor of the phases of trials, of blinding, of randomized control trials. Although there's a desperate need to want to do more for patients when you have them sick and dying, you need to know that the therapy is actually of benefit. It looks like the best benefit, beneficial therapies we have now are the monoclonal immunoglobulins, but unfortunately they need to be given very early in disease onset, really before you get to hospital, and they need to be given by infusions. So uh, that's logistically very challenging. Um, I think there will be a therapy, uh, just like with uh, HIV and viral hepatitis, there'll be an oral direct antiviral medication that will be given to people before they have severe symptoms will well, we'll prevent that. The timeline on that, I'm not sure of, but people last year didn't think we'd have a vaccine within 12 months, and we have many of them. Uh, so I think the global community, when it puts its mind to it, and it really has its mind and its finances behind it now, can achieve really amazing things. The very way we conduct trials changed from traditional design, conduct and analyze to ad adaptive trial designs, and we're a contributor to the WHO solidarity trial here, where the drugs contained within it can be reviewed and changed. So that we don't have to restart a completely different trial to try to accelerate the path pipeline for an effective therapy. And of course, there's still concerns about long term effects. And together with respiratory and ICU colleagues in Beaumont, we've set up clinics and research methodologies to try to assess this. And whether it being from pulmonary fibrosis, to myalgia, to myocarditis, to anosmia, all things that can dramatically impact people's quality of life. But really, there's a big story with this pandemic, and it's about the inequality, both at a local community and a global level. That we saw very early on that social inequity and lower socioeconomic groups were adversely impacted. One, because they were the groups that had to go to work and continue to have to go to work because they don't have income security and protection, because the type of jobs they have involved being there rather than being online somewhere. And two, because in many parts of the world, they are in the ethnic groups that are disproportionately affected by severe disease. Uh, and I think until we can try to address those and protecting people and offering them the ability to get tested uh, and to be protected in their workplace or protected by not being in their workplace, then I don't think we're really going to progress this. And that will apply to so many other infectious disease. And it's common to every infectious disease that has been a disproportionate impact on the poorer in society. Combined with that, the inequity on the global level, the variants that are coming from poorer parts of the world, we're going to ban those people from moving. 
But of course, the variants are going to continue to develop in those and many other countries around the world. And until we have vaccines that are available to all of the world, then we haven't really as a as a as a species move forward with this, I would say. Reinfection is certainly a thing, but it's a small thing. Um, and we will see as time goes on how much of the thing. This wasn't the first pandemic, of course. Um, it won't be the last. In terms of sheer volume of numbers, it's not been the biggest, um, but it's certainly been the most dramatic because the measures we had to take globally to prevent it becoming the biggest. Um, so from that, I would say there's going to be more of this. This graphic is disease X, um, the name given to by WHO to a project of what will be the next infectious disease. Uh, it's a program that's at least three years old, but in some form many years older than that. So this was in many ways a predicted uh, pandemic. Indeed, SARS-CoV-2 had been identified some four or five years before in Wuhan and identified as a potential target. This and many other infections represent spillover events. A virus that infects some other animal host on the planet spilling over into humans and that really is brought about by the expansion of humans into the natural world um, particularly in warm areas and forested areas so these events are going to become increasingly likely as human impacts spread further there are surveillance systems around the world to look for these to predict them and i think they need to be reinvested in and expanded upon there's a huge amount of human cost and tragedy an amazing human endeavor that has undergone in this pandemic but one of the greatest failings is if this doesn't change how we do things doesn't change how we prepare and if it doesn't change how we work <clears throat> thank you very much i look forward to uh, the question session thank you very much dr debara for that excellent and most informative presentation which should stimulate a lot of questions um, uh, later on after the the final speaker whom i'm going to introduce now so it gives me great pleasure to introduce our final guest speaker, Dr. Owen Clear, who is going to inform you what it was like to be an intern at Bowman Hospital during the pandemic. Owen graduated from the Arceside Medical School in 2020 with a first class honours degree. He is currently an intern at Bowman Hospital and was our ENT intern in 2020. He is one of the best interns we have ever had in ENT, and I'm delighted to say that he wishes to pursue a career in my specialty of ENT. So thank you very much, Owen, for agreeing to speak this evening, and over to you. Uh, well, thank you very much, first of all, Professor McCon walsh for a very kind introduction. Um, I'd also like to thank Professor Hill, Professor McConkie and Dr. DeBarra for what have been some excellent talks. Um, and it's a great honor for me to invite to be invited to speak at this um, event. Having just graduated from Worcester Society last year, and I'd like to thank the Biological Society for the kind invite. Um, so for many of us, the reality of this pandemic became very real on March 12th of last year, as was touched upon earlier. And it was when Leo Varadkar spoke to us announcing the first in a number of restrictions. Um, and in that speech, he said, we have to move now to have the greatest impact. And I don't know if you're anything like me, but at that time, I was thinking, we'll lock down for a couple of weeks and we'll be back to normal for summer. And I think over the last number of months, that's been proven very incorrect. But the reality of this pandemic became very real for me and my class of the graduating class of 2020 in RCSI on March 3rd, when we received this email titled Urgent, telling us to come for a meeting with Professor Hill and the rest of our lecturers that afternoon. And at that meeting, as Professor, Professor Hill mentioned, uh, it was announced that our long case exams were to be moved seven weeks early, and we were now having them in three or four days time on a Saturday and Sunday which left many of the class feeling somewhat like this, stressed, anxious. Um, but I think after having the exams done, we can say that it was the right decision at the time. And we were all very glad that we were able to graduate on time and start work. So I could have spoken tonight about curves and vaccines and 
all those kinds of things. But I felt that Professor McConkey and Dr. DeBar were far more qualified to that. So today I'll be focusing on my experience as an intern during this pandemic and I'm sure the experience of many other interns during this pandemic. So for the students among us, starting as an intern is scary at the best of times. And when you start call, it's absolutely terrifying. Everyone who starts is really lost. And anyone who tells you otherwise is lying through their teeth. It's okay when you do start to be lost and to feel like you don't know what's going on. Uh, because you haven't seen many things before and you, you're a very junior member of the team. But what's important to recognize is you do have many team members around you, such as your regs, your SHOs who are willing to help you. And it's not okay to not ask for help and to act on your own. So starting during a pandemic, you might ask, how does it differ? And to be honest, I can't tell you because my intern group and myself, we don't really know what it's like to work without COVID-19. We started last year in May in the middle of the pandemic, and we're still here in January in the middle of the pandemic. So for us working in the confines of COVID-19 has become normal. We don't know any different. One thing that was different for us, I will say, is we started six weeks early in May, which meant that we were fortunate to start with buddy interns or the interns the year above us at the end of our year who were able to show us the ropes. And I was also very fortunate, as Professor McConwall said, to start with the ENT team, who are absolutely brilliant in Beaumont Hospital. Um, and it's a rotation I really enjoyed. So day to day, what has it looked like in the hospital for me as an intern? Well, as you can see in the top left, it's looked a lot like dressing up in PPE and doffing and donning and all that other stuff. It's looked a lot like these chest x-rays of your classic COVID patient with bilateral ground glass opacities. It's also looked somewhat looking like this, looking at your phone in your intern group chat every single day of people going off as close contacts um, or testing positive. And it's meant that as an intern group and as NCHDs in the hospital, we've had to be adaptable and show a serious flexibility in covering our fellow interns when people can't do call shifts. It's led to great camaraderie amongst the group um, and great resilience amongst the group, having to work all these extra shifts and knowing that if you were to be off, there'll be someone there to cover your shifts. If I see the stat, I think out of 80 people who are working in Beaumont as interns at the moment, myself included, there's less than 15 of us who have not been off as either a close contact or having tested positive for COVID, which just really shows you how widespread this disease is. As was already touched upon, um, it, there's been a massive change in terms of virtual environments during this pandemic. And indeed, you know, during my upcoming interview and many interviews for the rest of my intern group, they're all going online now, which is a massive change for us. Now, as well, during this pandemic, I've learned some rules of a pandemic intern. Um, I've based them somewhat loosely off uh, the rules of the House of God, some satirical rules but from the book, The House of God by Samuel Shem, which is based on his experience as an intern years ago. The first of these is no swab, as in no COVID swab. Your patient's not going to have surgery. And if that doesn't happen, you as the intern are going to be blamed. So make sure they have a COVID swab. Number two is septic screens now suck. So as Professor Hill said, you all need to know how to do a septic screen. Often that's a urine, a blood culture and a chest x-ray. Now do a COVID swab alongside that. When you're gowning up to see a COVID patient, visors are better than goggles. The goggles inevitably fog up after 10 seconds. And it's not very much fun when you're trying to put in a cannula in fogged up goggles, completely blind, going off field. I can tell you it doesn't go very well. The fourth is if your patient who is desaturating is now complaining while you're doing the ABG, they're probably OK. And um, you get a good feel for patients in the hospital if they're very unwell or if they are less acute than other patients. And that's one rule that I've kind of gone by. The fifth takes a bit of explaining. So our on-call rota has been divided into one COVID or dirty intern, as it gets referred to as, uh, who covers the COVID wards. And that's based off other wards not wanting the COVID intern to cross-contaminate their clean wards with no COVID. 
However, I've, I've learned over the number of months that the COVID intern is the one who does not become a close contact and does not test positive because they know every patient they see has COVID and they wear their PP for every patient. Whereas the non-COVID intern might see a patient who does not have COVID because they're now in the clean ward who has spiked the temperature and the swab they send off during that septic screen comes back positive the next day. They've acquired it from a nurse or healthcare assistant. And the final rule is at cardiac arrest, you might think the first thing to do is to run in and check for a pulse or check if the patient is breathing. But the first procedure of cardiac arrest is to protect yourself and to don PPE to make sure that you do not get COVID. So tips and tricks for medical students now, I suppose, who are going to be interns either this summer in July or in the next number of years that I, I would say are general rules for your working life. The first is if you need something done, do it yourself. Otherwise, it'll be the intern's fault. Always, you're the junior member of the team and things roll downhill. So if you ask for fluids to be given, double check, go check that they're hanging up by your patient, ask the nurse again, make sure it's done. Number two, when you're on call and you're asked to see a sick patient, your first instinct will be to run in and see the patient. Don't. You always have time to stop, read the chart, find out a bit of background on this patient that you frequently won't know. You know, you never know what you might miss. You might be about to pour two liters of fluids into your septic patient who has congestive heart failure, which wouldn't be too great an idea. Uh, number three is really important. You have to learn when to say no. Every single day you'll be asked to do things that are frequently not appropriate. And as an intern, you can feel pressured to do them by either the ward sister or your reg. Uh, and you need to know when to say no um, in terms of self-preservation. Number um, four is um, that there is an art to getting scans and consults. So every single day as an intern, the majority of your job is getting consults for your patients or getting scans. And if you're not somewhat crafty about it, it's not going to get done and you're going to get given out to. So you have to kind of not lie, but you have to make them want to do the scan and the consult today. So some final thoughts, thinking back over my last number of months working as an intern overall despite covid and the lack of social life i would say it's been a great experience i'm really thoroughly enjoying it particularly working in surgery which i love and um, finally getting to practice what you've trained for again uh, as i said earlier it's really okay to admit when you don't know what you're doing no one is going to judge you for it particularly as an intern you are an intern for a reason you're still learning and make sure you do ask for help when you need it. Uh, number three is your supervisors. So your consultants and reg, is, they want to help you. They want to see you do well, particularly if you're interested in the specialty you're doing or, or just if you'd like to learn anything at all about the specialty, they're only more delighted to help 99% of the time. Just ask them. So again, I'd like to thank you all for the invitation to speak tonight. Uh, it's been a great honour to speak in front of this historic society at their inaugural address. And I'd just like to invite any questions. Uh, I've attached my email below for anyone who wants to ask me anything or discuss anything. I'm more than happy to chat. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Owen, for that very honest and realistic insight into the life of an intern. And um, at this stage, I would like to thank Professor Hill for delivering the excellent and very thought provoking Wittes lecture. Professor McConkey. Dr. Debarra and Owen for the guest presentations, which were excellent and very informative. Elise and I would now like to invite questions from the audience for you. If anyone has any questions, you can just type them in the chat and then we'll read them out for you. Perhaps I could start, uh, Professor Hill. Do you think medical school teaching and training has changed forever? Well, I, I think it has because um, there are certain things we're not going to be allowed to do. It won't be normal to have large group teaching in small confined spaces. So I think we're all going to have to change. Uh, 
there will be more online teaching, but there'll be a lot more small group teaching. And I think we're going to have to change the way uh, we act in clinical settings, because I think we're always going to have to think of what is the next COVID and be prepared for that. So I think the way we um, act in clinical settings will be very different. And as Owen beautifully outlined there, uh, life as an intern this year is very different to uh, several uh, previous years. And I think what's fascinating, the one fascinating thing, point that he says, and I'm sure it's really true, that the COVID intern is the safest intern. And in fact, as I, over the last number of weeks, have been looking to say, you know, can we get our medical students back in now? Do you know where the safest place in the hospital? It's probably in the ICU because you completely respect the rules. You wear COVID, everything is controlled, and it's probably the safest. The place you're most likely to get COVID is where, you know, a, a ward that's regarded as low risk because that's where you might come in with close contact. So I, I think how we behave and conduct ourselves in hospitals has changed forever. I, I come in there on that, uh, Arnie and Rory. I, I think I, li I really like that. Uh, I hope Owen doesn't mind, but I took a picture of that slide of his uh, how to what a COVID intern, uh, because that last piece is what I've been saying since since March. Um, that thing about the COVID intern doesn't get COVID and uh, throughout all of this staff on the COVID pathway really didn't get COVID but they got it elsewhere and uh, it was that presumption it's that asymptomatic below the waterline thing is the problem that people are somehow thinking that there's a clean area and there is no clean area and there is no area that's free of COVID but I think the safe way is and now we're getting to a point when we're using universal droplet precautions with patient interactions and then it's moving to a place when it's actually safe to be there. Dr. Debar, could I ask you a question? Do you think we've got more things right this time during the third surge? Um, from, from our experience in ENT, we've been requested to very few uh, open tracheostomies. Yeah, I think, I think in terms of the clinical management of those severe patients, yes, we, we learned an awful lot. And we were involved in discussions with myself and critical care and respiratory early on. You know, the first wave of the information coming out of China and then Italy was quickly intubate these patients quickly um, and that became apparent to us that that wasn't a good thing and of course the US data when they really got large numbers was shown that it really wasn't a good thing and you know the respiratory team are doing amazing work in stabilizing patients on non-invasive ventilation uh, and the UK data showing the same thing you can do an awful lot before moving to those extreme measures and avert a significant number of the intubations so yeah I think clinical management patients were doing better infection prevention control were doing better all of those things, but um, we could always have done better at the previous bits, but it's good to see that we are getting better and better at all these aspects. Thank we actually have a question that just came in. So um, this is from Rahi Shah. He says, thank you for all the wonderful presentations. They were very informative and helpful. Professor McConkie, would you know the vaccine rollout plan for RCSI students? Earlier years are considered in the last group, but would we be getting it before the end of the semester before we head out of the country? What are the timelines for Ireland's rollout plan related to who's talks about a vaccination report with the passport? So this is a, a very, very real question and lots and lots of um, people all over the world are asking the same question. Many of us in RCSI have uh, pushed very hard in our hospital linkages that our students in clinical attachments should be treated and considered in the same way as healthcare workers so that in whatever site they're at, they, they will get hopefully vaccinated in the rollout uh, in the hospitals they're attached to. That, of course, only works for clinical students. So hopefully our clinical students will, will get vaccinated wherever they are. For the um, some students who went back home, for instance, to Bahrain or Emirates for Christmas, were able to get two vaccine doses there, which has been good. And I can't answer when the earlier years who are not in clinics will be able to get vaccine because we really don't know at this stage yet. Um, even people who are 65 in the country who are not healthcare workers, we really don't know. It's also to some extent an impossible question to answer because it depends on the supply of the vaccines themselves and the companies that make them are not willing or able to give a guaranteed supply date for how many doses will come 
into Ireland on a certain day. So I know lots of opposition politicians are pushing for this, but it's nearly impossible to answer that question. So I'm sorry for the younger students, it's difficult. Yeah, Rah Rahi, I might be able to help you a little bit. Um, so the specifics, or the clinical students, our final med students are our first priority. Uh, and we want to have them vaccinated before they graduate. Uh, and that is something that Colin Henry, the chief clinical officer, has supported in writing on numerous occasions. Uh, we were hoping that if Astra the AstraZeneca vaccine had come through in the numbers that were expected, that we would have got our final med class vaccinated in the February, March time period. That's looking more like March now. Um, so we're really dependent on the supply of vaccines. So Beaumont uh, at the moment uh, still have a, a number of uh, healthcare workers, several hundred that haven't been, there's four and a half thousand staff involved. There's several hundred that have not received their first dose of the vaccine. And um, when they have been completed, the final med class will, will get it. But we can't predict with certainty when the vaccine arrives. So it, it's very difficult and one thing that struck me and I find absolutely amazing is the great sensitivity by lots of people about who should get the vaccine first and you can understand it there's great anxiety out there of course I'm biased I'd be promoting our final med class as the first uh, to get it but the the preclinical years I think it's going to be um, later on in the summertime when the availability of vaccine numbers are there had uh, to give it to everybody. So no definite answer. And that's just the nature of that. We just don't know the volume of vaccines uh, coming on stream and available. Thank you, Professor Hill. We have another question from Austin Eakin. Um, he says, thank you to all the speakers for their fantastic and insightful presentations. My question is for Professor McConkie. Professor, since the COVID vaccine, vaccines will play such an essential part in overcoming this pandemic, how do you suggest doctors best prevent and approach vaccine hesitancy, both within and outside the clinical setting? Yeah, well, thanks. That's that's a great question, and something that um, you know many of us have been working on for for a couple of decades. Um, it's I suppose the media has been dominated in the last uh, couple of months worldwide by the supply chain and delivery problems and we haven't seen huge amounts of opposition to the vaccine so far the vast majority of people who get access to them uh, want them and 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 take them so i think because covid is sort of as i said killed 2.2 million people that that sobers the mind a lot and especially people have elderly relatives and contacts so um my view has always been to be very straight and honest and engaging with people to listen to people to talk to them to reply to the slightly conspiracy theory emails that I get uh, about these things, which sometimes feels like a waste of time, but I, I generally try to engage with, uh, however briefly, with some sort of sensible rationality rather than just ignoring people. Uh, so I, I would say engage, uh, listen, and then try and uh, give people the, the, the facts as I know them. I don't think the vaccines are, are a final solution to this problem. I think we actually need much broader uh, public health outbreak control and many, many other things, much faster testing, much more pop up testing where there's an outbreak, uh, much more. We've discovered in hospitals that by testing not just close contacts, but casual contacts and even everyone who's been in a ward that we find more cases. So for every outbreak, I hope in the future in the community when we get our cases low, we'll not just test close contacts, but also an expanding concentric circles of people until there are no more positives found. And that's the way to keep the COVID down in Ireland, because there won't be enough vaccines for everyone in the world for probably a year or two. Uh, so this, this problem is going to continue for quite a period of time. And we need to think of it vaccine as one of a plethora of about 10 different major interventions, in my view. OK, so I, I think in the interest of time, uh, we will move on. And thanks again to all the speakers. Um, it now gives me great pleasure to announce the RCSI Biological Society Awards. The winner of the RCSI Council Medal at the Senior Case Competition is Leona Ward. So congratulations, Leona. The winner of the Dr. Arthur Stephen French Carroll Medal is Hayley Mulvaney. 
Congratulations, Haley. The winners of the Harold Brown Anatomy Medals are Kian Malosky, Kira Casey, and Natalia Lakic. The runners up for the Harold Brown Anatomy Medal are Marin Roman, Clement Fung, and Rahi Shah. The winners of the Mary Leader Medal in Pathology are Davika Dahia, Mohammed Al Mullah, and Lamise Al Al Sheikh. And finally, the runners up for the Mary Leader Medal in Pathology are Mohammed Alid, Hashim Hashim, and Cassandra Gressman. So, congratulations to all of the medal winners, and I hope I got your pronunciations correct. And um, it now gives me great pleasure to call upon Professor Hannah McGee, Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, to deliver the motion for the society. And apologies for keeping you uh, so late. So thank you very much, Professor McGee. Thank you very much, Professor Walsh. It was a, no apologies needed. It was a delight of an evening. Um, uh, very informative, uh, very inspiring. Uh, to hear the colleagues we have, and as somebody said on the chat, uh, just to hear and feel the compassion that everybody has for uh, our patients, uh, our, our fellow staff, and, and indeed our students. Um, it's been a real pleasure of an evening. Uh, uh, I think we, we are in the middle of, as everybody has said, a pandemic, uh, and an extraordinary, extraordinarily challenging time for everybody, um, and an extraordinary 88th Annual Biological Society meeting, uh, the first um, uh, online meeting um, but I think it will go down um, in history and wonderful that we have it taped uh, as a very significant event indeed and congratulations to the outgoing and incoming faculty presidents Professor Camilla Carroll and Professor Rory McCon Walsh. Um, I, I know that you know what a great honour it is to be selected by students um, and indeed to in time see your name on that wall on that board of very significant uh, leaders uh, of our faculty in the past um, and uh, some great, uh, great names there that you will uh, have followed in their footsteps. And congratulations to Professor Elisa Yu and to her council. Uh, what a wonderful event they have put on this evening and, and the activities during the year. Congratulations to the case competition winners. Uh, again, in such a challenging year for everybody, this is really a remarkable achievement. Um, congratulations to our head of our School of Medicine, Professor Arnie Hill, for a wonderful with his lecture. And uh, Arnie has credited almost everybody in the organisation for uh, making the programme continue in the way it has. And I would like to, to reverse that credit now and, and make sure that he gets the credit himself also for persevering with every challenge and every new change in every day of the week almost in the last year, uh, always with the goal that what's best for the students is what he's fighting for. Um, and with Professor Kelly's motto of um, we want to bring every student one year closer to graduation, and indeed if it was your last year to graduation successfully. Uh, we've had three great guest lecturers, Professor Sam McConkie, Dr Owen Devara and Dr Owen Clear, and uh, wonderful to hear what's going on in Beaumont. And I think in terms of their work, both their uh, clinical work and their research and their advocacy work, um, and as uh, Professor Hill has described, we also have a real champion in our CEO in Beaumont Hospital and in the RCSI hospital group, uh, in Mr Ian Carter, who always with the interest of the patient in mind, always supports our activities as a, as a, a medical school and university uh, in our aim to create great leaders that will make a difference in Dublin, in Ireland and worldwide. So to finish, I would like to propose the motion this evening that in this extraordinary pandemic year, the Biological Society is worthy of the continued support of the student body of the RCSI. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Professor McGee, for those very, very kind words. Could I call upon you, Elisa, as student president of the Society, to second the motion? Yes, um, as student president, I second this motion. Thank you, Professor McGee. Um, we have now come to the conclusion of the formal proceedings of the meeting. And at this stage, I would like to call upon Elisa to say a few words first. So I would just like to say congratulations to all our awards recipients. You should be very proud of your accomplishments. Um, we will have your physical medals and your certificates ready to be picked up at the lobby desk of, at York Street. So please keep an eye on an email that we'll be sending out when it's ready to be received. I would also like to send my deepest thanks to 
Professor Arnold Hill, Professor Samuel McConkie, Dr. Owen DeBara, and Dr. Owen Clear for your incredible informative speeches and taking time to be a part of our 88th inaugural address. I would like to thank everyone in the audience for joining us today and supporting our online inaugural address. If there are any students in the senior cycle, either year one or two, please consider applying for our senior case competition. And I hope that I'll be able to meet some of you in the future. Professor McComb Walsh, would you like to finish the closing remarks? Thank you very much, Elisa. Um, yes, I would. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank uh, Professor Hill for delivering the excellent and very thought provoking Wittes lecture and Professor McConkie, Dr. Dabara and Dr. Clear for their very excellent and informative guest presentations. They were very well received. I would like to thank you, Elisa, and the Council for setting up this evening's inaugural address and meeting, which I thought was excellent in all respects, very topical and pro very professionally organised. I very much look forward to working with you all during my tenure as faculty president. I would also like to thank Jackie Knowles, the Student Services Coordinator at the RCSI for her excellent support. I would like to thank you, Professor McGee, for your continued support for this society. I would also like to thank the President of the RCSI, Professor O'Connell, and the Vice President, Professor Laura Viani, for attending this evening. Finally, I would like to thank you, the audience, for your participation this evening in what I feel was a very successful evening. So good evening and have a very safe and pleasant weekend. Thank you. Sorry, if you don't mind me coming in again. Um, if all the recipients of the medals, as well if, as the speakers, I'm sorry for keeping you so late, but if we could just get a photo at the end, as well as the Biological Society, that would be great if you could just stay a few extra minutes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. If you don't mind, um, do is it all right if we have um, the four speakers um, have their cameras up so we're ready for um, just a final photograph if you're still here? Um, if we could turn on the cameras. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm not sure how we make our photograph come up. <laughs> oh no, it's okay. We have someone who's taking the photos, so I'm just going to get word from her if she's got it. Okay. Um, okay thank you so much. Um, they got the photos. Sorry, <laughs> one second. Um, so we are missing Dr. Owen DeBara. I don't know if he's still here. Um, I don't think he is, but. Um, OK, so we'll just get a quick screenshot if that's all right. I'm sorry for taking so much of your time, but we'll just make this as quick as we can. But um, thank you again for for being a part of our night. So I'm just going to take a quick photo right here. OK, one, two, three. Please. Thank you. Have a great night. Well done, Elisa. Well, oh, oh, also, before I, before I forget, I just wanted to, I'm, I'm going to send an email later out. We would love to give you some, just a small gift for taking the time to be with us today. So you'll probably hear from me very soon. Just a quick email so we can get an address that is most convenient for you to get that sent out. Thanks, Elisa. Well done. A great evening. Thank oh, you so Super much. job. Well done, Sam. Probably get all of us comfortably in Beaumont Hospital on Monday morning. <laughs> <Eight o 'clock. laughs> Thanks very much Bye. again, Elisa. It was a great event. Really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Clear. I, I really liked your talk. It <laughs> oh, oh, we can get you back to general surgery. It's OK. We'll take you back. No, you don't have to go to ENT. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm so. All right. Thanks again, guys. Really enjoyed it. Cheers, guys. Have a great evening. Well done, Lisa. Thank you. Okay. And if we could get the
winners up. So the first one that was announced was, I believe, Leona Ward, are you still here with us? If you could turn on your camera. I'm not sure if she's here. OK, then um, is Haley Mulvaney here? No? Yeah. Uh, oh, there we go. OK. Hi. Hey. So we'll a photo with you and Professor McComb Walsh, if that's all right. OK. <laughs> Um, Professor McCone Walsh, um, do you mind turning on your camera? It's a lot of technical, technical stuff <laughs> this year. Um, let me just confirm. Okay. Sorry, very different this year. <laughs> I'm trying to. Um, Professor McCone Walsh, is your camera on? I'm not sure if you can hear me. Um, OK, uh, Professor McCon Walsh. OK, we'll do we'll do us. Oh, there we go. <laughs> oh, he was there and he was. Oh, hello. Hi. I, I don't mind you taking a photo with the with all the winners just really quickly. I'm at the absolutely delighted to. Okay. Great, so I have my photographer ready. So if you want to smile, one, two, three. Great, thank you. Thank you, Haley. And then next we have um, the winners of the Harold Brown Anatomy Quiz. Are you still here with us? If you are, please turn on your camera so we can get a nice photo. Hello. Hi. Who is um, Natalia here? Uh, no. OK, I'll just turn off my camera. I think it's harder for them to get photos. But um, so if Natalia is not here, I'll just get um, Professor McCall Walsh. Do you mind just turning her camera on again? I'm sorry. Not at all. Delighted to. OK, so all right, say cheese. <laughs> Smile. That's great. Thank you. And congratulations to you guys. Yes, That's our great. first online Harold Brown. That's <laughs> it's a great accomplishment. <laughs> Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you. And then we have the runners up for so Marin, Clement, and Rahi. Are you still with us? Hi. Okay, so we'll wait for everyone else to get their cameras on and then we'll just take a quick photo. Marin or Clement, are you here? It might be a solo picture. <laughs> All right, that's fine then. Um, I don't, I don't, I haven't heard from them. So, um, Professor McCall Walsh, do you mind um, taking another photo? Not at all. I'll be doing. <laughs> All right. Um, one, two, three. Cheese. Thank you. Thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. And we have. Um, Mary Leader Medal in Pathology, Zavika, Mohammed, and Lamiz. I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. <laughs> and if you are here to turn on your cameras, that would be great. And we'll just take a quick photo. Bye. Um, I wonder if your two other team members are here. I don't think so. OK, so we can just take a quick photo with you and Professor McComb Walsh then. All right. Congratulations. Let me. <laughs> OK, one, two, three, cheese. That's great. Thank you. 
Um, and then finally, we have Mohammed, um, the runners up for the Mary Leader, Mohammed, Hashim, and Cassandra. Are you guys still here? Hi, Cassandra. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, we'll just take the quick photo then. Okay. Thanks for staying, Cassandra. <laughs> no worries. I carried the team and they know it. I'm kidding. <laughs> One, two, three, cheese. Great. Some part of the team. Yeah. yeah, no, the real ones who carried it aren't here, so I can. Yeah. Do that now. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and Biological Society, if you're all committee members who are present, are you able to turn on your cameras and we'll just take a quick committee photo? A rarity, seeing everyone. <laughs> Okay, so Neha, are you good? All right, Rachel, your camera's black. I don't see you. Is that everyone? Okay, good. All right, okay, everyone smile. Okay, great. Okay, thanks everyone. Congratulations. That was a great night. <laughs> an absolutely amazing job this evening. You were so professional. Uh, the topics were so well received. Uh, I, I'm really looking forward to working with you now during my tenure, so congratulations. Oh, thank you. I'm very excited to work with you as well. You've been so helpful. This would not have been possible without everyone here, so thank you. No, and you, you heard what Professor McGee and Professor Hill said at the end. You know, they, they, they really thoroughly enjoyed this evening. It was so topical. Um, so well run. So congratulations. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. And everyone else have a great evening as well. Thank you for staying for the whole time. And it was so nice to see all your faces. Finally. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen all of your faces at once. Amazing Elisa. job, Elisa. Fantastic. Thank you. Elisa, maybe um, at some stage we, we should send a, a letter on behalf of the whole council and perhaps myself, naming everybody on the council uh, to all the uh, all the speakers and to Professor McGee, you know, thanking them. I think that will go down very well. Yes, I, I agree. We'll be sending them a brochure with all your names printed on as well as this current committee. Um, everyone will be receiving a copy of that just so you can keep it for memory as well. But I, I agree, Professor McCall Walsh, we should do that as well. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Have a good night. <laughs> thank you for spending Friday with me. 